Thanks for joining us here today with Prairie Presbyterian Church. We continue with our series, Be Still and Behold, as we explore God's presence together. Today's theme is God in the Tent. We acknowledge that we are gathered on Treaty One land, first entrusted by Creator God to the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, the homeland of the Red River Metis. have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. I can never escape your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. Where can I go? Where can I go from your spirit? Can I flee from your presence?
Our prayer of confession this morning is tied to our theme of centering prayer, which we will explore later in the service. Let us pray. God of all power, we come before you today from the busyness of our lives. We've carved out this space, this time, in which to focus on your presence, to be still and behold. Thank you that you have given us your church, a people who come together and create these spaces. Today we confess that in the midst of, well, everything, it's often hard to take time to be still, to be grounded and to be centered. And so often we don't even try. In a world of constant action and motion, we can feel so much guilt for taking time to truly rest. And so we confess that we do not often take even small moments of Sabbath, let alone entire days. We worry about all the things we may be missing out on. We worry about the tasks which need to be done, the people we need to reach out to, the lists we need to make, and so it goes on and on. We confess that even when we stop, our minds often continue, never truly resting in your glory and your peace. Amen. Friends, hear the good news as inspired by Psalm 139. In front of us, behind us, to our right, to our left, look, God is there. In our past, beside us today, waiting in the future, look, God is there. In the shadows, in the light, look, God is there. From the top of the mountains to the bottom of the seas, in the morning, in the evening, in every moment, God is with us. Know today that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. And wherever you are, whenever you are, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I invite you to share a sign of peace with someone around you or to reach out to someone in your life to share the peace of Christ. In the first month in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was set up. Moses set up the tabernacle. He laid its bases and set up its frames and put in its poles and raised up its pillars. And he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent over it as the Lord commanded Moses. He took the, coven the covenant and put it into the ark and put the poles on the ark and set the mercy seat above the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the curtain for the screening and screened the ark of the covenant as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle, outside the curtain, and set the bread in order on it before the Lord, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the lampstand in the tent of meeting, opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle, and set up the lamps before the Lord, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the golden altar in the tent of meeting before the curtain, and offered fragrant incense on it, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He also put in place the screen for the entrance of the tabernacle, he set the altar of burnt offering at the entrance of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and offered it on the burnt offering and the grain offering as the Lord had commanded. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing, with which Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet. When they went into the tent of meeting, when they approached the altar, they washed as the Lord had commanded Moses. He set up the court around the tent tabernacle and the altar and put up the screen at the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the Israelites would set out on each stage of their journey. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and fire was in the cloud by night before the eyes of all the house of Israel at each stage of their journey. Our reading today is from the last chapter of the book of Exodus. And it tells us about the completion of the building of the tabernacle. 
The tabernacle was basically where the people of Israel would worship God, and there was a whole lot of instructions. We'll talk a little bit about that, of how that took place. But essentially, the structure itself was uh, mostly a tent. <laughs> and so today, we're talking about God in the tent. Um, the main part of it was a tent that had uh, the holy place and then the holy of holies divided by a screen. And actually the uh, temple that we'll talk about next time was the same structure as the tabernacle, essentially, where you had an outer structure called the holy place and an inner structure called the holy of holies. Uh, the rest of the tabernacle was actually outdoors. It was um, not covered by a tent. It was a courtyard and had kind of a fence around it in a way. Um, and so if you're ever hearing something like the tent of meeting, that's often talking about the, uh, just that inner part of the tabernacle, uh, the place where God's presence was um, believed to dwell and where Moses or the priests could go in and meet with God and offer sacrifice and things like that. So we can talk a little bit about what the tabernacle is, why it was built, but most, mostly I want to talk about why understanding how the ancient Israelites thought about the presence of God showing up in a massive tent that they built in the wilderness several thousand years ago actually does help us understand how the presence of God operates in our lives now. <laughs> because that's kind of a big gap to, to jump across, but there's actually so much here. So please stick with me as we go through this. Um, there's a point in the Exodus story where God actually asks or instructs through Moses that a structure be built so that he can dwell there. So right in Exodus 25, verse 8, um, God declares, and they shall make me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them. But there's kind of a context to why the tabernacle is so important. And really just having an understanding a little bit of the second half of the book of Exodus is important. So here it is a little bit in the outline. So last week we talked about Exodus 19 actually, which was God on the mountain and this big grand moment. And I mentioned that um, right away when we get into Exodus 20, we get the 10 commandments. Actually Exodus 20 through 23 is a bunch of the law that's given to Moses while he's on the mountain with God. Um, Moses then goes down the mountain and actually tells people this is the law. Um, and in Exodus 24, the people uh, agree, that sounds great. We're going to keep the law. It's going to be fantastic. And then we read this. I'm going to read you this part of Exodus 24 because I think it's really fascinating. It says, then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, um, don't worry about who they are. <laughs> and 70 of the elders of Israel went up and they saw the God of Israel. They saw the God of Israel. You're not supposed to see God, but here it is, Exodus 24, verse 10. This is huge. Not just Moses, but Moses, Aaron, that's his brother, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel saw God. Massive. And it says, under his feet, so just to give us a detail, under his feet, there was something like a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. God did not lay his hand on the chief men of the Israelites. They beheld God and they ate and drank. Isn't that bizarre and fascinating? I think it's really interesting. God didn't lay his hand on them, as in God didn't kill them, right? Because the idea was like, if you saw God, you died. But God lets them live and they see God and they have, a, they have a feast, they have a party, they eat and drink. Well, that was great. Then the Lord said to Moses, if we continue on, come up with me on the mountain and wait there. I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua and Moses went up onto the mountain of God. To the elders, he had said, wait here for us until we come back to you. Look, Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. So basically what's happened is they haven't gone all the way to the top of the mountain. They've kind of seen God lower down. Now God's saying, okay, Moses, come with me. Moses and Joshua go. And they say, we're going to leave Aaron basically in charge. And um, any problems, you can go to Aaron. 
and off they go. We read Moses went up the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. So basically Moses just sits there in the glory of God for six days. And on the seventh day, Moses is called. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the Israelites. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. So this is the, the classic 40 days and 40 nights um, deal that we know about. So Moses goes up the mountain. Now he's by himself with God. And this is where we have in our minds, this is where God gets the two tablets, or Moses gets the two tablets from God that we know from like the Charlton Heston movie, if we've seen that. Um, and then he's gonna go down and, and give them to the people, right? But actually what happens before he gets these tablets, even though he says, like God says, this is what, Mo what he's gonna give to Moses. Before that happens, you get Exodus 25 through 31. So seven chapters. And in those seven chapters, most of it are the instructions for how to build the tabernacle. And then also things like, you know, here's what the vestments of the priests should be. And like, so everything to do with like the tabernacle and how things are gonna take place in the tabernacle over about seven chapters. And he also gets the two tablets with the law that had been given before. And Moses then goes down to see the people. And this is that classic story of the golden calf. If you know that one, basically the people have turned away from God. They've decided, well, we don't know what's happened to Moses. He's been gone for 40 days. And uh, they melt down a bunch of gold. They create a calf out of gold. And they decide, decide that's going to be our God. Let's worship that God. And that'll be fantastic. Moses comes down and sees it, smashes the tablets. And, you know, things don't go well for the people. Essentially, God and Moses end up having a conversation about this. God's initial response is, let's just wipe out the people and start over. I'll just make you into a great nation, Moses. We'll just use your descendants. It'll be, it'll be fine. We'll just wipe them out. And Moses actually intercedes on behalf of the people. And part of that intercession that Moses does is he asks to see God's glory. Now, it's interesting because it seems like he's seen God's glory a whole bunch, but he's really saying, I want to see, you know, somehow more than what I've seen before. And God goes along with Moses. And so what happens in Exodus 34, so this is 32, 33, and 34 are really important, this golden calf episode, and then Moses interceding, and then, in, uh, and then the next chapter, um, Moses then receives new tablets from God with the commandments, goes back down the mountain. The people are now gonna be obedient. There's a covenant renewal ceremony that they have, and Moses has seen the glory of God, and so now Moses is actually reflecting the glory of God so brightly off of his own face that he has to cover his face with a veil anytime he's gonna to talk to the people. So that's, verse, that's chapter 34. The rest of Exodus, Exodus 35, through 40, so six more chapters, are all about just building the tabernacle and then like creating the vestments and that kind of thing and the priests getting in order. So essentially, out of this second half of Exodus, you've got seven chapters out of 20 that are the instructions for building the tabernacle and then six chapters out of 20 that are just about building the tabernacle, the actual construction of it. So it's hugely important but it's important to see it in the context of what's happening in the narrative as well, especially what happens in between getting the instructions for how to build it and then actually building it. We have that golden calf episode, which is really, really important, and the covenant renewal that happens. That's really important. Um, I was reading a piece by uh, Rabbi Erwin Kula um, called The Role of the Tabernacle. Is the tabernacle a sacred center of intense love or an outgrowth of our sins. And here's what he writes. He says there are two midrash that offer contrasting perspectives on the tabernacle. The first teaches, once there was a king who married a beloved daughter to a foreign prince. Following the wedding, the couple prepared to leave for the prince's land. The king said to the prince, I cannot bear my daughter leaving, but neither can I keep you here. Do me one favor, in your home prepare a small area for me where I might be with you. 
So God said to Moses, I have given you the Torah. I cannot part with it, neither can I take it from you. So please, wherever Israel goes, let them make me one place where I might be close to you. According to this Midrash, the Mishkan, that's the Hebrew word for tabernacle, the tabernacle is for God. The tabernacle is a place of love, intimacy, and deep connection among God, Israel, and Torah. In contrast, other Midrash, the other Midrash notes that the golden calf, after the golden calf, God said, since you have allowed evil into your midst, I cannot dwell with you, but neither can I completely abandon you. Therefore, make me one small area where I can dwell in your midst. Here, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, is necessary because the people are sinful. If the community were perfect, it would not need a tabernacle at all. So you have these two different ways of understanding it. Um, there may be complementary rather than contrasting, I think. You have your life, and I've given you the law to help you live well, God says. I loved the Torah, God says, before I even gave it to you. It is what you need as you go about your regular life. But also let's have a place that's for us, a place in your midst where God, God's people, and Torah can come together. That's the first view. The second view is the people's sin, their turning away from God, makes it impossible for God and the people to be together. So God's presence cannot be experienced in life. And so a plan is uh, built, uh, a place is built and set apart. It is made and kept holy so that God's people can still experience God's presence despite sin. Often people understand the whole sacrificial system as being built on this second view. When you move into the book of Leviticus, the next book in the Bible, it all seems kind of unrelatable and pretty tedious, but what that book is actually about is providing God's people a way to actually live with God's presence, given that we sin and that that makes us unable to stand in the presence of God. So how can we experience God's presence if we're always messing up and that's separating us from God? That's actually what Leviticus is really about, is all of this system to help us be able to come back to God. It's actually the same story that's recounted in the garden in a way. The humans eat from the tree and then they hide themselves with God, from God. They separate themselves. And then the rest of the biblical story is about how they might be restored into right relationship with God. The tabernacle is seen as the location of enacting that restoration through ritual, through structure. So when the golden calf incident happens, it's as if God is saying, oh no, I've just given your leader all the instructions for building the place where we are going to connect. And now you've replaced me, the one who has been seeking, right, seeking you right from day one, right from day one when I asked, where are you? And you've replaced me with something that isn't even alive, an idol. That was the very first commandment. And you've broken it before we've even really started. Our relationship broken before you even gave it a chance. And yet the tabernacle also becomes the place where the restoration of that relationship can happen, where God will dwell despite the people's turning away and the people can learn to rest in God's presence. And so we can ask in all of this, with what do we replace God today? And then where do we go to repent? And repent just means to turn to turn from that which we've put in the place of God. Where do we go to have our lives put back together? You might say, why can't we just turn to God? So we'll just turn back to God. We'll just do that. Don't we say that all the time? Yes, we do. But what does it look like when that is really lived out? God gives Torah, the law, and a good chunk of that in Exodus is how to build this tabernacle. It's really like it's giving specifics of what it looks like to have a place where one can turn back to God. What does that then look like for us? 
What are the specifics for you? What structure do you have in order to live with the presence of God in your midst? Um, there's sometimes a bit of a confusion as well um, around this term, the tent of meeting, because sometimes it seems to be referring to the whole tabernacle or a part of the tabernacle. And sometimes it's referring to a, a different tent where Moses went to meet with God. And Moses did have his own tent that he set up where he would go and meet with God before the tabernacle was constructed. Now, um, it seems like there's kind of a progression that happens between uh, a few different things from a transcendent God moving closer and closer to God's people. The first is the God of the mountain on Mount Sinai. The mountain is sort of this far off place where the transcendent God then breaks out and it creates fear amongst the people as they stand far off in awe of what they're experiencing. That's the first place. The next one is the tent of meeting of Moses. He actually set it up outside of the settlement or out of town, if you're gonna think about it that way. And the only person who ever goes in there is Moses to meet with God. Moses is the only intermediary between God and the people. Only Moses experiences the presence of God. And then the tabernacle is built. The tabernacle is right in the middle of where the people are settled. It's right in the middle of town. God wants to live in the midst of the people. And in this system, in this space, it's not just Moses, it's also all the priests who become the intermediaries. And in fact, this is a mirror of what the people of Israel are supposed to be for the whole world. God's people are supposed to, it's supposed to be the intermediaries between the world and God. So here we have this progression where now the tabernacle is how the people experience the presence of God on a regular basis, not just in these big moments, who knows when, but on a regular basis, God living in the midst of the people. And we see that as this moves forward, God moves closer to the people until we get even farther down in the story and we get to the point where God goes way farther than anyone thought in being close to his people. God becomes a human being, closer than anything. John's gospel opens with a vision of transcendence and creation. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life and the life was the light of all people. When you skip down to verse 14, you read, and the word became flesh and lived among us and we have seen his glory. Jesus lived among us or dwelt with us. The, the word for this is actually the word tabernacled. It really just means dwelling. That's what tabernacle means. This is the dwelling place of God. Jesus tabernacled with us, dwelt among us. See, actually the tabernacle, when we as Christians reflect on it, is a powerful metaphor for Jesus, even though it's one step along the progression of God making himself present among us. Jesus is the residence of God among God's people. And Jesus is the place where we go to be restored as we look to turn back to God. In Jesus, God resides among us in our midst. And when we go to Jesus, we can once again live in God. This is the language that we're given in John's gospel of we abide in God and God abides in us. Jesus is the one to whom we turn for our true restructuring. In Jesus, we have our true home with God. Amen. For the next few weeks of our series, Be Still and Behold, we're going to talk about centering prayer. The first four weeks were about finding God in our creativity. And so there was a lot about doing. And our last few weeks, we'll focus on ritual. So again, possibly more doing. In many ways, centering prayer is the complete opposite of this. 
It's the practice of not doing. When we talk about centering prayer, we have to throw out some of our preconceived notions about prayer. In centering prayer, there is no conversation. We aren't asking for something. We aren't using words. In some ways, it's more like just basking in the glory of God coming into God's presence, turning everything else off and focusing on our breathing and one simple word or short phrase. It can be a bit hard to do on video, but we're going to try. And since this isn't live, you have the chance to pause this if you need to, to move to a different place or settle yourself differently. The idea is to be comfortable and grounded, and this will look different for every person. For me, sitting cross-legged tends to be the best way to do this. But for others, it may be sitting in a chair with your feet on the ground or lying on your bed or couch. Maybe you're on the beach. The idea is to feel like you don't have to think too hard about the way your body is placed and a place that feels safe and comfortable to you. It's hard to be centered when you're worried that you're going to trip over or tip or that your neck hurts from trying to sit perfectly straight. You might need pillows or blankets or to move to a quieter space. So feel free to pause this and make yourself comfortable. Now that you're comfortable, I invite you to think of a word or phrase which helps you bring God to mind. It might be something from the Psalm we read today, something from the story from Exodus, or of course, something completely different. Only you will know what word works for you. Some that I use are peace, light and comfort. Or maybe it's even the refrain from the Psalm that Ashley has sung every week. Now that you've got a word or a phrase, I invite you to close your eyes if that's something that you feel safe doing and just take a few breaths in and out. Pay attention to how that feels. Imagine the spirit of God filling you and spreading out into every part of your body. Now bring your word to mind. And all you're going to focus on for the next two minutes is your word or phrase. Your mind will wander. This is incredibly normal. You're not failing at centering prayer. Each time you catch yourself wandering, just bring yourself back to the word without judgment and return to your breathing in and out. I've set a timer, and so at the end of two minutes, I will let you know. This will not go on forever, I promise. Let us take a moment to breathe and enter into prayer.
And that was two minutes. For some of you, that may have felt very, very long. And for others, as if only a moment has gone by. And so I invite you to slowly blink open your eyes if they were closed, to return to breathing normally, and to join us in song as we finish our service. Amen. Precious cornerstone.